And as I said, it's got much cheaper. Satellites, many of them are now the size of a Rubik's Cube. They're called cube satellites. Um, so there's a shoebox, and others are still the size of a fridge freezer. So if you've got a cube one, you can build 20 of them. In Nigeria, the universities, they're building their own cube sats in the unis, uh, stick them in the front of a, you know, top of a cockpit, and before, you'd have to pay someone to take up your fridge freezer, sized satellite, on one trip, and you paid everything. You were priced out. The price has come down. Now you'll say, can you take my 20? And then another one's going with 10, someone else is going with 20, another one's going with 5, and they're putting a fridge freezer up, and you share the costs. So the costs have dramatically come down, and they've come down because you can get the rockets back now. Well, Musk can. You can get two rockets back at a time. So not sci-fi, it's sci now. So, costs have come down, lots of countries are playing, that's the UAE, they have sent a probe to Mars, they're sending another one back to Mars, and they got it back actually next year. We're going back, um, almost certainly the target will be the uh, south pole of the moon, uh, near the Shackleton crater, it has its own geography, it's great plains, it's mountains, it's caverns, it's lots and lots of tunnels, huge 100 mile long tunnels and caves in the, on the moon. And the Shackleton crater is where the Indians have proved there is water ice, tens of millions of gallons of it, which you can make hydrogen out of, oxygen out of, drinking water out of, and in it there's helium-3, helium-3, if we can crack nuclear fusion, if AI can crack nuclear fusion, before it turns us all into paper clips. Um, it'll say, look, you idiots, this is how you do nuclear fusion. Now get that helium-3, stick it in there, and the Chinese believe, Chinese scientists work out, we will be able to power the Earth's energy needs for 10,000 years with clean nuclear energy, radiation-free nuclear energy. Now, this is theoretical. We haven't got nuclear fusion. We haven't dug the stuff up. But the theory is that when we can do those two things, 10,000 years worth of clean, radiation-free energy. I think that's an argument for going, but I know there's an argument that we shouldn't be wasting our money. Photoshopped, not for long. They're testing these. Actually, the, the, the Chinese, yes, Chinese, they've got a whole underground base which they've built in China, in caves. Uh, they've actually built their moon base in the caves where astronauts, taikonauts, as they call them, live, they are testing what they intend to do in less than 10 years' time. You know, it's a scale model in a cave. You're best off in a cave probably because of the radiation. You don't want to be just having a nice glass dome where you look up at the stars. You need to either cover it with the soil or go down into the caves. That's the plan. Space suit at the back, so you can rock around in there, go 100 miles, get out in your space suit, have a walk. Private enterprise again. Toyota are looking at prototypes of these for a few years' time. Um, Musk has already got the contract with his Falcon 9 SpaceX heavy lift rocket to uh, take the uh, NASA and other astronauts up. They take them to the ISS already. Um, Blue Horizon has got the contract, I think it's after 2028, to take people to the space station they're going to build. It's all coming down the line. 3D print the base. You know, it's much cheaper than taking metal bars up there and steel. You bake the regolith and you build your base. Mining asteroids. We have landed on an asteroid. We know there's asteroids with more rare earth metals than have ever been found on Earth in the whole history of mining. If you've got any gold and they find one made of gold, sell. Flag follows the trade. Another thing in my world, that's the East India Company and its private army. Well, once the British state had worked out that this lot had been out robbing the world um, and it was so integral to the British state, they incorporated it into the army. Um, the flag follows the trade. It's inconceivable to me, given the human history, that if the commercial companies are out there, the state will not be either with them, <coughs> excuse me, or very close behind. I don't have a timeline, but in 1903, 
when the Wright brothers took off, I bet they didn't think, you know what, in 27 years, more Americans will be traveling by plane than by train. There's no way they could have thought that, but that's what happens with tech. That's the good news. <laughs> Space elevators? Maybe. Elevators. I think they were built first in Chicago, put first in Manhattan. Within 10 years, every city in America utterly transformed. And again, I don't think the people that built the first one thought, in, you know what, in 10 years, every single city in America utterly transformed, in, and then the world. So I don't know what it's going to be, but there's going to be something that comes along that will just revolutionize stuff. That's Mars, uh, Musk, after Musk has nuked it in order to terraform it. He genuinely said he could do that. He said, I want to die on Mars, just not on impact. There is no way in hell his timeline of 2050 for a million people will happen. It's fantasy. But I do think there will be uh, people on Mars by that time. But a million, no chance. That's um, a vision of a space city. Don't know what that is. It's all Greek to me. Quantum. It's the sort of stuff that it's going to, you know, about the elevator. It's just going to be at lightning speed. And that's the future. Looking back and looking forward, I'm an optimist. If Kepler knew 400 years ago we'd have solar panels up in space, which we do have, and sails that propel little tiny spacecraft, which we do, we have people amongst us. In fact, there's one in the front row down there who were the geniuses of our... Uh, yes, you, sir. Yeah. We have geniuses amongst us. Young generation that are going to see miracles. We live in an age of miracles and wonders, and Paul Simon's got a new album out. <laughs> we do have time for a few questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Tim, if you just put your hands up, um, a steward will come to you and I will pick on you. Uh, gentleman over there. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting Hi. talk. Hi. Thank you. Um, you referred to the uh, Treaty of Outer Space and nuclear weapons and that they're prohibited under that treaty. Um, how long do you see that lasting mm. and what sort of on the pun, impacts do you, do you think there might come from uh, that no longer being? I think the, the no nuclear weapons in space will hold because they have parity. So you don't need to. You don't need to take that step, forcing, well, not forcing, but knowing that they will take that step. I'll give an example, the original Star Wars in the 70s, the Americans had the kit, they knew they could do it, they could put a layer, early defense warning, which would stop the amount of warheads that the Russians had, that the Soviets had. And they could have done it, but Reagan was talked out of it because everyone said, OK, they, these aren't the figures. They've got 1,000 nuclear warheads now. We think we can stop. Just, what are they going to do? They're going to build 5,000 warheads. And we haven't got the layer to stop that. And that's why it didn't happen. Um, so I don't see the logic of taking that step. Lasers, I think, is different. It's, it hasn't got that fear cachet. So regarding the treaty, I think as a building block, it will remain and then hopefully be built on, but it won't be built on for several years because at the moment, it's the Klondike Gold Rush, and nobody in the Klondike Gold Rush ever said, hang on, hang on, can we just stop? And... No, you just went, and that is what is going to happen, uh, I'm pretty sure. But when they've got through that, and remember... The Americans got the new 45, Russians 48, a few years after. It took them years more before they then sat down and thought, we need to talk about this. And I think it'll be the same. We're going to go through this you know, rush period and then X years, 5, 10, I don't know. We need to talk about this and agree rules of the road. Hopefully, we go together. I'm an optimist. I genuinely am an optimist, but no, I don't see any room for a treaty at the moment. Uh, sorry, one last example. Um, testing. The, um, testing. The um, ballistic missiles to hit satellites. Four countries have done it. 
Um, they all know they can do it. So the Americans have said, why don't we all stop this? We all agree we won't do any more tests because it creates debris. And the Chinese and the Russians won't do it because they've got parity there, but they are 10 years at least militarily behind the Americans on Earth. But they know that what controls all this stuff here, so the Americans have got that, the Russians have got that, the Chinese have got that, the Americans are much better, but where they have parity is here. So they're not going to give up their, their, their... They're going to keep testing to perfect their ability to hit American satellites, knowing that that will help them with their disadvantage here. So until we go through this period, because it's still new, no. But it will happen. We, 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 we always talk eventually. Um, gentleman at the front. Hi, th uh, thank you. Um, okay. does, uh, does it, do you get to a point that, that where space becomes so important that it actually changes the geography of... Uh, I'm sort of thinking back to your first book here, mm -hmm. so, or your straight up almost example. At what point does that no longer matter as much? Mm. And how does that change the well, two, two things. Firstly, um, my first book was called Dirty Northern Bastards, <laughs> with a back cover called Soft Southern Bastards, pardon my French, and it was a book about football chants and how we talk to each other in this country. But secondly, um, no, um, I, I've heard this argument a lot. I completely understand it. I don't think geography ever becomes less important. It simply what is important about it and which bits of it are important changes. So, um, this is not a good example, but America felt completely impregnable because it has an ocean on each side. Nobody can touch it. And you can't invade America. Even if you were stupid enough, can you imagine going into um, LA? Everybody's got a gun. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the first thing. But you can't even get there anyway. And you've got a nice friendly nation up there who, you know... Canadians, and, and you've got a massive desert, and then the Mexicans, you know, you're completely safe. And then air power comes along, and they fly some planes into buildings. Now, it's not an existential threat, that, which is why it's not a particularly good analogy. But the point I'm making is about that geography was crucial. In air power, it changed. Cruise missiles changed it, but you've still got to launch them from somewhere. Uh, you've still got to think about refueling in aircraft. I mean, I'm sorry to go on about military, but um, uh, Britain, when it wanted to go out and rob the world, needed some ships. What do we make ships out of? Wood. What have we got a lot of? Oak trees. Fantastic. Those oak trees now are less important. But then coal became... Oh, we've got coal as well. You know, fantastic. So, it, for me, it'll be the same in space. It'll be about distance barriers, radiation belt, go round them, uh, slingshotting your way past a planet to get the extra speed. You know, that, that is, it's, it's not an exact geography, I accept that. But the, the, the concept of it remains the same. Geography will always be important because time and distance is important to us. Uh, so, gentlemen in the middle. Oh. You alluded a lot to the uh, relationship between governments and largely military and private enterprise, both in terms of history with the East India Company and today with somebody like Musk. The private enterprise is at the moment all American and you wouldn't, well at least my perception is that the, the Russians and the Chinese do not have a private enterprise element to their space activity. How important do you think? And, and, and the private enterprise has shown NASA to be a bit of a slow coach. Really. Yes. Uh, so how important do you think the private enterprise element of the, of the American effort is in giving it a lead over mm -hmm. everybody else? Um, it's important, but it's important in, in most of the countries, including China, which I'll, which I'll come to. I mean, the French space industry, uh, commercial, is huge. Britain, with people like Boeing, huge. Not Boeing, sorry. Um, uh, thank you. Whatever he said. <laughs> lots of them. One way, but lots of them, uh, which we're selling. Um, in America, you've got these massive companies, Blue Horizon, uh, but lo lots of the ones which whose names are not as familiar, including Boeing. 
But in China, there's more than 100 startup companies just for space, and one of them will be SpaceX. But there's a difference in that there is no such thing as a real private company in China. Every single one of them answers to the Communist Party because that's the system. You cannot, as some of their major industrialists have found out, you cannot work out with the Communist Party. You'll go to jail. I mean, it just doesn't happen. You know, they, are, they call it private enterprise, but it is tied into the state. And, but the difference with China is that China sees this much more even than America as a strategic development that the state will make, but with its private enterprise, because it's, it's capitalism with Chinese characteristics now, isn't it? Um, so it, private enterprise is huge in, in, in China, um, not yet as big as in America. Italy, massive uh, space industry, private enterprise. Germany, it's growing. Britain, as I said, very much a second tier, a senior second tier space power with its space command, with the satellites that it builds, with its two space ports. It's got the fourth biggest satellite network in the world, fifth, sorry, um, Skynet, uh, and it makes satellites. So private enterprise is actually everywhere. The one thing, actually, Roscosmos, which is the Russian private one, but I mean, it's just a, it's absolutely a wing of of uh, the Russian military, you know, because these are different political systems. Sorry, that was a very long answer to say, no, I disagree, private enterprise is huge in all of these companies now, and this is the big difference between the 60s and 70s. China has got some incredible startups. Japan, Japan's space industry is just rocketing. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Julian, do you mind going upstairs, and then we can take a couple of questions from up there, and there was a gentleman here. As you mentioned in this latest space race, do you see the rise of a space hegemon? And would it mirror what happens here on Earth? Or would it be some sort of parody, as you mentioned earlier? Do I see a space hegemon? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, two. America and China. Now, there's three at the moment. China, America, and Russia. But Russia is a failing, declining power. With its demographics are against it, its politics are against it, its industry is against it. Doesn't, in it. What does it make? It makes fossil fuels and Kalashnikovs. You know, they, they just don't have, they don't have the wherewithal to stay with the Americans and the Chinese. So those two, absolutely. Now, the Americans are 10 years ahead. It's a big, big part of this is super semiconductors. Um, the, the, the Dutch and the South Koreans and the Taiwanese have all just agreed with America that because these Netherlands is a semiconductor superpower, Taiwan semiconductor superpower, and they have agreed that the super semiconductors that they make they will not pass that technology onto the onto the Chinese and the Chinese are really struggling to make that leap. You know they, they make mass of conductors they can't yet make super semiconductors. And as long as that gap and other technological gaps, they're going to continue to be 10, year, 10 years behind America. But I think it's inevitable they will eventually match them. So they will go to the moon, and they will have a base, and they, if they get there first, they will be at Shackleton, and they will obviously be looking around, and they'll try to nail the exact best place, and then they'll have their own Artemis Accords. Excuse me, this is our safety zone. And see how we like it. Quickly following behind them, America and all the allies that went, countries that are rich enough to have a presence and a base. I mean, I'm, I'm jumping forward five, six, seven or eight years after the Americans and the Chinese lay the groundwork. People like Japan, UAE, the ones with the money, they can have bases, and from there, the jumping off point is to the moon, because you hardly need any fuel to get there if you launch from the moon. Um, and again, the same sorts of countries. Two. It's, it's, I was asked recently um, at the, at the London Defence Conference was two weeks ago, um, is this the Chinese century? Because you know, last was the American century. I said, yes, but it's also still the American century. You know, this century is two great power centuries. Um, we've taken a lot of questions from men. Um, yes, maybe over here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hi, I'm just curious, uh, why is it taking so long to go, go back to the moon? Yeah. Uh, I mean, with all the technological advances, we should have gone yeah. back. What was the point? 
What was the point? Apollo 11 made it, yeah? Apollo 12 made it and back. Apollo 13 nearly didn't make it back. Didn't make it there, but, didn't make, and, but made it back, thank goodness. Great movie. Apollo 14 went. Apollo 15 went. And each time, they got the same sort of area. They'd dig around a bit, get a few rocks, come back home. What's the point? You've beaten the Russians. You've proved to the world. What's the point? And this is the rationale. It costs a lot of money. 0.5% of GDP, that's quite a lot. Especially when you're fighting the Vietnam War or you're doing this or you're doing whatever it is that you're doing in America. So Nixon pulled the plug. You know, they'd all got the t shirt, NASA. What's the point? There is no rationale. I mean, there were some weird, weird ideas about um, moon bases that, that they didn't have the money or the tech then. But you fast forward, and then suddenly the, the technology allows you to do two things that makes it. A good idea, if you agree with that, to go. One, military. We now need all this stuff, integral part of our economies. And two, the commercial potential is incredible. Now, it, the economic modeling might not work, but imagine you're the leader of a country in 1900 and you're switching from coal to oil for the navies. Churchill was the one that switched us when he was first sea lord, um, I think. Um, you're not going to say, you know what, let's not bother. I'm sure they'll sell us some. No, you go and you steal it, and then later on pay for it. It's the same here. You cannot take that chance that these incredible economic riches, both at state level and private enterprise level, there they are. You want to be left behind? No, you're going to go. Um, it's Klondike. It's, that's, that's why. It's now. You can turn a profit and be military superior. It's driven us for several thousand years now. It's not stopping yet. Let's hear from some people upstairs. Uh, can we have a positive question? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a positive question. Hello. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Um, so you're talking about sharing space, and I, I like the idea that uh, more uh, space flights and work in space were shared than wasn't uh, from Apollo and Soyuz and link up in the 1975, 76, uh, Mir and ISS and so on. Who else are we sharing space with? You know. Um, Have you seen the clangers? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Sorry. Uh, well, speaking of the clangers, the, the, the Congress reports uh, when they're investigating uh, unidentified oh, yeah. aircraft or objects. Yeah. Them. Congress accepted there were things flying around, but they didn't know what they were or who was putting them. Five percent of them they didn't know. Uh, right. They can explain ninety-five percent of them. Uh, and I wonder whether you had any thoughts on the remaining five. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can you remind me uh, what they're now called? They're not called UFOs, are they? And it's unexplained, yeah. something phenomena. Yeah. yeah, it's not gonna. It's never gonna fly. <laughs> um, see, it's not just all on Google. Um, I am beyond convinced that there is intelligent life. You know, not just microbes living on Mars. I am 100% convinced. I'm far from convinced they've ever been here. Far from convinced they're even dimly aware of our existence, because you'll know the distances we're talking about. You know, it, like I said, 20,000 years for us to get to the nearest place. You know, and it's a big... So I, I, I'm very, very unconvinced that the 5% are actually, you know, at the very best, an alien probe, maybe, but nah. But I'm reminded of Neil deGrasse, um, big uh, astro um, writer... Thank you, him. Thank you. Who's Neil deGrasse? Anyway, that well-known space writer. Um, he, said, he said, saying there's no aliens or alien life is like going to the um, Pacific Ocean with a cop and scooping up some water. Saying, See, I told you, whales don't exist. <laughs> and that's why I'm persuaded. You know, when, you, when you look at infinity before your brain melts, and you look at the potential for how many habitable, as far as our conception of life is, which is another issue I have with, um, you know, we just assume. I've read eminent scientists telling me, you must have carbon, you must have, and I don't believe it. There's got to be other things that we can't yet imagine. In fact, sorry, I'm going off on one. Um, Arthur C. Clarke said, we can have as much 
understanding of what they might be as a fish understands electricity. Yeah. And I am reminded of the Star Trek um, episode, the original Kitsch one. Um, they're down on a planet, they're walking around, uh, they dig up some nice silver sparkly sand, they bring it back to the ship, you know, you know, leave it in the lab, and it takes over the ship, gets into the comms, and says to Kirk and his mates, ugly bags of water, why are you trying to kill us? Which is, for me is one of the best lines ever written. <laughs> because the concept behind that, you know, these are little grains of sand which are smarter than we are, but their view of us is ugly bags of water. And that's another reason, I think, there's no way in hell we're on our own. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge thank you. For <laughs> thank, you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.